This is the newspaper and it will tell you every, 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 everything you need to my know. My belly's all filled with poo. What did you do? I ate my mother and my father too. Why did you do that? Because they look tasty and so do you. Do. I do God's work. You do sinner's work. And now, my dear, the cat have you. As soon as we hear the music for 1984 is The Prey, we get the feeling we've seen this movie before. Well, you probably haven't seen this movie before. The only reason it seems that way is because the music is a perfect clone of Harry Manfredini's Friday the 13th score. And that makes sense because that's basically what this movie is trying to do. It's trying to cash in on the early 1980s slasher film craze. And what better movie to copycat than the film that started it off, Friday the 13th. The first kill in this movie is of an older couple who are around, sitting around a campfire eating some chow, and then uh, the wife goes and takes all their silverware down to the lake to clean it up. Um, why? Because you die alone in slasher movies. So the wife is off cleaning up the dishes, and the man is left to his own devices. So what does he do? He starts sharpening his axe and uh, chopping wood with a pipe in his mouth, which is the ballerest thing you can do, right? Very uh, 1950s. So she's down at the lake cleaning up the dishes. She hears her husband scream. So she goes back, he's dead of course, and we see the most cliche uh, slasher sequence. Uh, a cliche so prevalent in slasher movies that uh, I used it myself for my opening sequence. One thing that really set this movie apart from other slashers and in a bad way, mind you, is the constant and arbitrary insertion of wildlife footage over and over again throughout the movie. Um, it's so weird. One particularly weird sequence was when they showed a millipede marching past the screen, and then they, uh, they uh, added in the sound of soldiers uh, marching in lockstep. It's so weird. Another weird thing about this movie was sometimes they would have like mumbly conversations of dialogue as the, the group climbed up the mountain or whatever or during the camping sequence. It's all like mumbly, like a million different conversations going and it's so boring. It does nothing, it explains nothing of the movie or the script or the story that we're watching. I mean, maybe they were going for realism, like this is how people interact, you know, the satellite conversations. But, I mean, what about us, the viewer? I mean, we're kind of bored by it. Like, stories about flooding and shit. Oh, it's great. You better cook tonight. I love this clip because it's so true to not just horror movies, but all movies where 30 year olds or mid 20 year olds are playing like high school kids. Let's go. We're not going to the prom. In a minute, I'll catch up. Yeah, that's right. You're not going to prom because you're 30. Those days are long gone. And so, anyway, the story goes on. The campers find a spot, they bed down, and they start camping. Well, this whole camping sequence that they show next is so boring. And yes, it's cut with the boat. This is where the wildlife footage gets absolutely out of hand. And it's also more the mumbly conversations that has nothing to do with the movie. Come on. You guys are gonna love it. Hey, yo, yo. Clearly, these types of scenes were put in as an effort to 
make an already scant and thin script in a short movie a little bit longer, but like I said, it just makes it boring. If you took out all the wildlife footage or footage of people just hiking up and down the mountain or whatever, you would have like a 45 minute movie, but at least it would be funner. I have no idea. No. Excuse me. What? Did this kid just say excuse me? Are these people your friends or your college professors? <laughs> what the hell? Come on, Gail. Turn it off. Let's listen to the woods. Silly Greg, you can't listen to the woods. It doesn't have a good beat. Another thing that really annoyed me with this movie, and it's a total horror movie cliche, I mean, I doubt that this was the first movie to do the POV with the heartbeat sound, but oh, it does it so often in this movie when we're at the, the point of view of the monster and we just hear boom, 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 boom. It's been done to death. I guarantee it's been done a million times before this movie, and certainly after this movie. It always annoys me. It's so hackneyed. Ugh. So sometime during the night, Greg and Gail get killed. The next day, the campers, the rest of the campers, wake up and find them missing. So they kind of debate whether they should wait up for them. They think that they uh, just kept on, had an early start, and uh, went on down the trail. But uh, for some reason, the long-haired chick, forget her name, uh, doesn't feel that way. And then this is the first time that the wildlife footage is actually used appropriately because she looks up and sees buzzards circling. And I think we all know what that means. Mm -hmm. So at this point we uh, see the the boss man of the forestry service. Um, this is his only scene in the movie and he gets the privilege of telling the monster's background story. And, but, so he's telling it, but it doesn't really explain why he kills. Later we find out why, why he kills, and I won't spoil that for you because it's actually pretty funny. It's probably one of the better moments of the movie. And so, he's telling his underling, the handsome forestry ranger, about the story, and then he goes out to find the teacher and the wife who were killed at the beginning of the movie. One thing that I thought was original in this movie was the whole mountain climbing sequence. I don't know if it was done before this, but this is how the monster kills off the other two remaining men. And it's pretty original. I'm pretty sure Wrong Turn, the original Wrong Turn, ripped this off. So the forestry ranger goes deeper in the woods and finally sees the last remaining camper left alive. And guess what? We finally get to see the monster who's attacking her. And guess what else? He's totally a ripoff of the Jason Voorhees character. You know, uh, when his mask is off, that is. He's malformed, he's bald. He looks a little bit like uh, um, Chunk's monster in The Goonies. So, Spielberg, you ripped off the prey. Sorry. What was his name? Chunk. No. Sloth. How could I forget? I recommend this movie if you are into slasher movies. Definitely see it at least once. It's worth at least one viewing. It's not great. It's not memorable. But at least it's watchable. Which is way more than I can say for Evil in the Woods. That was just hard to get through. So, I give it... Six out of ten squat fires. Till the next one. <laughs> oh shit. Droid Ferox Productions. With a name like Droid, you know it for rocks.